Welcome to the Church Universal series, where we seek to tell the often untold story of the many groups, outreaches, and apostolates in the Catholic Church, which are making a positive difference in the world through their charitable works and prayerful lives. Hello, I'm Father Joseph Mary, and today I'm speaking with members of a group numbering 2.5 million members in 182 nations. My guests today are Sid and Donna Hayden, who are Midwest Regional Council members for the Focolare Movement. Welcome, Sid and Donna. Good, Good to morning, have you Father. here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, many of our viewers are not Italian, so what does the word Focolare mean? Well, the word Focolare is Italian, and it means basically fireplace or hearth. And it comes from uh, the early days when the Chiara Lubic, the founder, of the Focolare began to live a spirituality of unity and communion and in war-torn Trent, Italy. Um, people began to know her and this group of girls and as they did outreach to the poor and to those who need clothes and so forth and uh, they would go over to this house and they left the house thinking about how much like a family it was and how much uh, mm -hmm. it was like sitting around a fireplace. Hmm although they didn't have a fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like that warmth of, they could f sense God's spirit, mm -hmm. and there was a warmth to what was going on there. And you mentioned that it was a war-torn area. Talk a little bit about that, how it came out of this time during the Second World War. Well, Kiara had, uh, early on, uh, when she was very little, uh, wanted to become a saint, wanted to become holy. And over time, as she grew older, she wanted to give her life completely um, to God. And um, during the war, she and these young girls would go to the bombing shelter and um, they would open up the gospel passage and they would read excerpts from that. This Trent was an area where there was a lot of bombing that was going on. Yes, so they were Trent was a small mm -hmm. village. Mm -hmm. um, at the base of the Dolomite Mountains. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a main passage for the Germans into Europe. So um, uh, it was bombed quite heavily, daily. Mm. So um, in the midst of this bombing um, and in their desire to follow God and what they thought he was asking of them at the time, which was simply to love him and love their neighbor. Um, they made the extraordinary efforts to address the needs of the community in Trent. Mm -hmm. So Kiara herself, she wasn't a religious, but she consecrated her life to God. She had this sense as a young woman that she wanted to give her whole heart to God. She mm -hmm. did. She mm -hmm. did, a and she actually did this in a concrete way one day. She went uh, to the altar, and mm -hmm. she offered three flowers hmm. with her gift to consecrate herself to God. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting, too, Sid, that during uh, the Second World War, that she begins this, and she has really no intention to found some kind of a movement, but very soon, within months, in this time of turmoil, there were hundreds of companions that wanted to join in the spirituality. Mm -hmm. Well, I think she had, uh, she and these first young girls who uh, made this commitment to God, really began to try to reach out to other people. And um, so the spirituality is, is very communitarian. It has its roots in trying to do, not only for themselves, but for the community that surrounded them. So. Um, as they would uh, find clothes and food and uh, help the homeless and those ravaged by the war, mm -hmm. they began to, um, that spirit of giving, that spirit of reciprocal love began to spread throughout the community. So it wasn't mm -hmm. too long that not only in Trent, but in the communities that surrounded Trent, people said, I want to live like this. I want to have the kind of peace that these enjoy that these young girls have in the midst of this devastation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it rapidly spread because of that. And then, as, uh, and then eventually it was all of Italy and then it became Europe and then it became to the States. And 
Now it's in, a, as you said earlier, 182 mm -hmm. different countries. So there was something tangible about what the Holy Spirit was doing. You know that when you see something grow so rapidly and the founder, like St. Francis himself, really had no intentions of founding some community, and yet others felt attracted to the Franciscan spirituality and what Francis was called to, Mm -hmm. something of God's going on there, right? That you, exactly. Is that something that you sensed when you first encountered the Focolare movement? It was. It, it was exactly like that. We went, we were invited by friends um, to their home and they had told us that I'd like you to meet some friends of ours. I think you'd enjoy meeting them. And uh, that night there were several couples there for the first time like us and two <coughs> young men from Switzerland <coughs> And they um, were telling us about Chiara, her first companions, how the Focolari movement started. And um, when we left, we remember looking at each other and saying, did you get it? <laughs> and uh, we, neither one of us got it. But what we knew immediately was we wanted to go back. Mm -hmm. We were drawn in some way by the atmosphere that was there, which is this atmosphere of unity and where mm. two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus is there. And um, we felt, looking back years later, we really felt that that's what we were drawn to that night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that reminds me of my own experience and so many of the workers that came here to EWTN, that mother could have never accomplished this just on her own. But the Lord brought other people, professionals and different fields, to come and assist in this work. And it's like when you came here, you experienced that God was doing something, you wanted to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it sounds like that was something that you experienced too. Yeah, Kiara has used the, um, she has said that it was like um, a pen doesn't know what the author is, is writing mm -hmm. or painting. but. So she was, that, she was that pen, the instrument in God's hands. And um, because of the devastation of the war, it was obvious that all things passed. And they asked themselves, what, what lasts? And God was the answer. Mm. And so uh, they really began to live radically. And that, that desire to have Christ present among them, I think was the catalyst for, as Donna had mentioned, when we went there, we didn't, we left thinking, Focolari, what's was that? What was that? You know, mm -hmm. but it was something about those young men who were there, and the way they spoke, the joy that they exhibited, the peace that was there, uh, kept us going back. And eventually, we finally figured out, ah, this is what this is about. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, we have a, be a beautiful little video here, which explains the beginnings of the Focolari movement, and shows us some pictures, and we actually get to hear the voice of the founder, Chiara Lubick. So let's take a look at that now. Chiara Lubick was born in Trent in 1920. At the age of 23, she consecrated her life to God. It was the founding event of the birth and development of one of the largest ecclesial movements of our time, the Focolare Movement. The adventure of the Focolare movement began in the context of World War II. We saw that all the small dreams we had were going up in smoke too. We were faced with the fact that everything fades, that everything is vanity of vanities, as the Bible says. But I felt as if someone was asking me, is there an ideal that never fades, that no bomb can destroy? I told my friends this, I said, Yes, there is. It's God. Let's make God the ideal of our life. God, who at that time was manifesting himself as love. We believed in love. In just a few months, a community of people emerged that was modeled on that of the early Christians, whose only bond was evangelical love, expressed in a complete sharing of spiritual and material goods. It was a contagious way of life which spread quickly beyond the small city of Trent and was welcomed by people all over Italy and Europe. Then, in 1958, 
it began to go beyond the confines of Europe. One of its highly original characteristics is the fact that from the beginning, Chiara and her movement were called to become witnesses to a completely new communitarian experience in line with the unity willed by Christ. This spirituality of unity rapidly penetrated the Orthodox, Anglican, Lutheran and Reformed worlds, giving life to what's been described as the ecumenism of the people. The encounter with the major religious traditions of humanity has shown Chiara as an ambassador of peace, of dialogue and of fraternity around the world. But those who have no religious affiliation also find a source of inspiration for their lives in the focolare spirit. They feel motivated to collaborate with it in defense of universal values, such as peace, justice, freedom, and environmental issues. The contribution of Chiara's work and thought to the development of a culture of dialogue and peace has been universally acknowledged. You know, uh, when Mother Angelica first moved here, there was a lot of anti-Catholicism among many people, but the sign that she put out in front of the network was this place of prayers open to people of all faiths. I loved something that was said in that video about the ecumenism of the people, that there's a sense of this desire for unity, of respect, of understanding one another. Could you talk about the spirituality of unity of the Focolare movement? The premise is, uh one of the gospel passages that they read in the uh, bomb shelters were, may they all be one. And they thought if this is Christ's last prayer before he is to die, surely that's what they want to do. And, mm -hmm. they, and they really made the commitment and the pact between themselves to live for this, may they all be one. That spirituality of unity was not exclusive to any particular person or, or peoples. And so it was meant for everyone. So in a very real sense, it's, it's, uh, it was to permeate from person to person, building relationships, trying to build the kind of love, mutual respect that is uh, reciprocal, that mm -hmm. I love you, you love me. And uh, in that, you, you discover the things that you have in common. And um, so that's why people of different faiths, people with no particular faith, find something that resonates with them in the spirituality mm -hmm. of unity. Mm -hmm. so. I think it's important to mention too that this uh, uh, love that we're talking about sounds to the ear, it can sound very simple. Mm -hmm. um, that it's everything's roses and everything's wonderful <laughs> yes. and we all love each other here. Um, in reality, it is much deeper than that and it's based on the love of God that I love Jesus in the other person, that it's not just a sentimental kind of love, but it's the Jesus in you is, it's that kind of love. Mm -hmm. um, so the other side of unity is suffering. Mm -hmm. It's taking up your cross. It's embracing the suffering that comes with loving in an extraordinary way. And that could be anything from um, giving up a chair that's very comfortable to you. It could be mm -hmm. from um, like listening to someone for at length <laughs> that you don't think is very interesting, but right. you're out of love for them, you're listening to them. It could be to the point that, the, that, that her and her first companions loved each other to be ready to die for each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they actually made a pact, right? That they did. They would be willing to die for each other, that they would have this culture of giving to one another. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. but that unity among them was the most important, the most important thing for them to do. Mm -hmm. Mention that uh, story, little story you told about even children are part of this movement and how they learn this sacrificial giving which Jesus teaches us from his cross. That was his greatest act of love, right? Right. The, 
the young, even the little bitty children are taught this. And so very often they share experiences about um, having a cookie that their brother or sister <laughs> didn't have. But to see Jesus in that person, they broke their cookie in half and gave mm -hmm. their brother or sister the other half of the cookie. That's a sacrifice for them. Mm -hmm. That's the other side of the coin in unity. Right. So it's taught at a very early age so that it becomes a part of who you are. I mean, in, in, in the wartime, it was very practical, or I mean, very realistic that they could mm -hmm. die. Yes. I mean, really die. Mm -hmm. But for many of us, we're not faced with that. Um, but to die to ourselves. And so often that means I, I have, unity is not a compromise. It's not coming to an agreement that you both are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. It's really trying to see the other person's ideas, listen to them, get to know what they're talking about, and then you share the same with them. And as a result, there's a mutual respect and mutual love that takes place. But th there's always, to really get to real unity, there seems to always be a suffering. I have to mm. die to myself because yes. of what I particularly want to do, maybe you don't want to do. Maybe I'd like to go do this and maybe you'd like mm -hmm. to go do that. So we have to, you know, oftentimes we die to ourselves. So it's not a way of compromising your own faith to get along. No, no. Mm. no. When, when we saw the pictures of the, um, mm -hmm. of Kiara and the different, you know, she's been to different places. Right. Different, uh, she's speaking, spoken to Buddhists, she has spoken to Muslims. And in all those places, uh, she's never watered down her Catholic experience, mm -hmm. never w watered down her experience. She's always shared it from the point of view of what really happened. And they have respected that. And I think, you know, St. John, St. Pope John Paul II yes. has now, you know, has said at one point, we need to have a respectful proclamation. And I, I think that's what we do um, to build unity. Mm -hmm. We focus on the things that bind us together. And it really seems in, a, in our own time when we have so many political tensions today, there's really a desire in the heart of people for unity, of finding a way for unity. Is When Pope John Paul, St. John Paul, met with ecclesial movements, he said that they're part of the charismatic nature of the church, meeting the needs of the time. Mm -hmm. right. So do you see people attracted to this, that it's a need of the time, they're attracted to working for unity? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, how many times do we put on the TV to, today and we see these altercations between, mm -hmm. I'm on this side, I'm on this side, and before the other person even gets a chance to finish speaking, the other side already has an answer back and <clears throat> you don't see anyone listening mm -hmm. to what the other person is saying. And so that's a big, that's a big part of making yourself one with somebody is not planning on what you're going to be saying before they're finished, but to really be there with them and listen to what they're saying to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's really a big component of it, right? Just respect for the other person, willing to listen to them, not trying to impose my viewpoints necessarily upon them, mm -hmm. although we don't compromise on our faith, right. but we respect people where they are and let God do what He is doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, very humbling t uh, uh, when you try to do this, when you try to love someone, uh, that you understand, it becomes very clear that you're not the person who's going to change them. Right. You are, God will do that, but you simply do your part by loving them so that they experience the love of God that maybe they've mm -hmm. never experienced before. Do you have any practical examples how you've interacted with people of other faiths or uh, even people of no faith, right? That po people who have no religious uh, background are even part of the Focolare movement. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I remember once when we moved to um, uh, near Atlanta, Georgia, um, <coughs> there were uh, some Muslims that had got to, to know the Focolare uh, in Chicago. Chicago is where there was a, a headquarters at that time. And when we moved from Indiana to Georgia, um, they let them know that there were some people in the area who knew the Focolare. Mm -hmm. So we were, 
given their names and asked to just contact them. So we were invited over to their house. And Donna and I, at the time, certainly <laughs> didn't see ourselves as uh, interreligious spokespeople. Uh, quite frankly, didn't know a lot about uh, Islam. Mm -hmm. But uh, we went to love them, and what we said we can do on our way there was to really be love for them and to be open to them and to, as best we could, understand them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out to be a, a beautiful relationship over many, many years. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. knew, if you were part of the Focolare movement, that there would be an openness on your part yeah. and a, a charity on your part. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's really what the relationship became built on. They were able to share with us their life experiences um, that they may not have shared with anyone else. It was very humbling um, mm -hmm. to be part of, of that interaction with yeah. them. Mm -hmm. and to understand where they were coming from. Sure. You know, uh, and the great love they had for Mary. I never knew that that was part of their faith. So there was a commonality there that, mm -hmm. you know, so it... That focolare is under the Pontifical Council for the Laity, mm -hmm. and it's officially named the work of Mary. Is that, mm -hmm. is that right? Correct. Correct. Right. So talk about that. Well, uh, you know, you could, I, I guess if I was going to say who, who had the idea of it be the work of Mary, I don't know if it was put on the application mm -hmm. when at some point they thought, well, this is an, a movement that needs to be approved by the, by the church. I don't know if it actually was put on the application, but in, when you look at Kiara's life and the love that she had for Mary, um, there are a couple instances that probably draw, that I can share with you. Um, a small thing, when she was uh, 21 years old, so she had already given her life over to God. She had already said, that this is, I want to marry him. He becomes my spouse. And at a certain time, her mom had asked her brother to go to the store to get some milk. He didn't want to go. But out mm -hmm. of love for <laughs> her mother, Kiara said, I'll go. On the way there, um, there was a small little village called Madonna Bianca. And while she was going there, she heard a voice said, give yourself to me completely. So there was a connection there Madonna with... Madonna Bianca means... White mother. White mother, uh -huh. the, yes. Uh, and it, there was a statue there of the Blessed okay. uh, Mary. Uh, another time was when she um, was on a retreat with some Catholic... Um, well, I, I suppose it's... There was another instance when she was... Um, bombs were coming down to the bomb shelter very close to them and um, dust filled the bomb shelter and she, when it had kind of died out, she realized that one of the fears that she had was she would never be able to say a Hail Mary again. Mm -hmm. So there's always been this constant love of Mary with her. Mm -hmm. um, one time in particular, she was in front of the Eucharist um, meditating and she, she was thanking God for being present in tabernacles all over the world, uh, thanking you for Him for giving a presence of Christ there. Mm -hmm. But she said, why didn't you leave something for Mary? Yeah. A presence of Mary. And from there she thought she heard, I want to see her in you. So mm -hmm. the relationship between her and Mary was very strong. So it, it seems only appropriate that it right. was seen as the work of Mary. She always saw Mary as a way to Jesus, that as a way to her son, mm -hmm. that she would take her to her son. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, thank you for telling us uh, about the Focolare Movement. Any uh, final thoughts about the Focolare Movement that you'd like to share with our viewers, why they might want to be a part of the Focolare Movement? The thing that I would say is um, when, when there's war ravaging, people have a tendency to understand that there's unity that's needed, that mm -hmm. things are not right. But, you know, you can look at your own life and your own situation, and there are situations where um, you realize something's just not quite right. I need to find something. For Donna and I, this was a discovery that's meant uh, a life-changing event for us. Um, through job changes, through marriage, through kids, raising kids, it has been a way for us to find a way to love mm -hmm. as God would want us to love and to, to embrace those sufferings that come along that we all face and a way to get through that. Um, I think at the Synod, 
uh, the bishop said at the family synod, mm -hmm. the bishop, uh, the pope said something about families are messy. Yes. And it's true. Family life is messy. <laughs> yes. There's tiny wars all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so the focolari and this spirituality of unity has been a beautiful way for us to, despite what may be going on around you, mm -hmm. um, to focus on unity and God being in the center of that war. Awesome. Sid, if people want to find out more about the Focolari movement, what, the, what should they do? Well, there's a multitude of ways to do it, but probably the best way is to go to the Focolari website, uh, which is www. Focolari, that's F-O-C-O-L-A-R-E dot org. Now, if you, that's the international site, and there are multitudes of languages, English, French, Mexican, you name it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you go to Focolari dot org backslash U.S., that should, uh, and then from there, there are other links that will meet, um, address you to different, um, not only here in the United States, but a wealth of information about the Focolari, about Chiara, Mm -hmm. about the work that's done in the arts, law, new humanities, mm -hmm. uh, a variety of things. And a close, their closest contact. Good. Well, we've, we've enjoyed having you on, and we look forward to having you on again. Thank you, Sid and Donna. Thank, Thank you, you very Father. much. St. Paul writes that God <laughs> gives a variety of gifts and inspires a variety of services for the common good. What gifts has he given to you? What service has he inspired in you? Perhaps you hear the call to work and pray for unity in the world by being part of the Focolari movement. May God bless and guide you and make you an instrument of his peace. See you next time.